Welcome to On Health with Houston Methodist. I'm Zach Moore. I'm a photographer and editor here, and I'm also a longtime podcaster. I'm Katie McCallum, former researcher turned health writer, mostly writing for our blogs. I'm Todd Ackerman. I'm a former medical reporter, currently an editor at Houston Methodist. I'm Kim Rivera Houston Weber, and I'm a writer here at Houston Methodist. Katie, how often do you stretch? I actually stretch a lot, which I don't know it was if that was the answer you were expecting, but I have a reason that I stretch Why pretty often because I often suffer from joint pain. And if I don't keep up with my stretch routine, I do find, I know this may be debatable, but I do find that if I don't stretch, you know, probably two or three times a week, especially if like, I haven't really worked out on a day, like I need to at least stretch. So I don't, you know, can get myself. So I'm not so tight. Um, I find that like, Typically it's my knees. My knees are like achy the next like week. Um, if I get out of my stretch routine, I'm, I mean, anyone else stretch this much? I'm guessing I'm in the minority here. Yeah. I'm not a stretcher. Yeah. It doesn't surprise <laughs> me. Kim, come on. Are you, do you stretch? Um, Help me out. <laughs> I want to affirm you, but I'm going to have to tell you at the end of my workouts, when the instructor, like, make sure you get a good stretch in. I'm off that bike. I am doing something else. I'm getting a glass of water. I'm yeah. sitting in front of a fan. I am not stretching, so I'm not a good I will admit help. that I'm not a stretcher. If that makes you feel better, but yeah. I just don't have the patience for it. Yeah. Well, that used to be me, Kim. And then I kind of just have like accrued these years of like achy knees or like all of a sudden my shoulders bothering me, my neck or my lower back. And so somewhere along the way, I've kind of like tried everything and stretching is this is the thing. I don't know what's actually helping because I do a bunch of stuff, um, but I'm in the stretching routine now. And I think that's better than not being in one for myself. I'm not in a stretching routine. I, yeah. Does that surprise you? <laughs> no, I kind of like. I, I mean, look, I know a lot of people don't stretch and mm -hmm. I think, cause I look, I didn't used to either. So, I mean, like, it's not, it's something I have forced, literally forced myself to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not surprised that. Well, my, my wife, she stretches before bed when she gets up, she's like, nice. I got to stretch. I'm like, okay. It's a good <laughs> habit. It's a great habit. She, well, she's sore all the time. So I, I right. think this podcast will be very, uh, helpful to her. Okay. I yeah. I was saying, me and Sarah got some stuff yeah. to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not sore and I don't stretch. So I'm like, Let's let's talk about it. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's, you know, and, and we're gonna get into all this today, but I think that's kind of the prevailing theme of there are all these different things you can do to prevent joint pain, but if you don't have any, you don't probably need to be doing them. And that's and it's debatable whether some of these different things actually help with joint pain. What were you gonna say, Todd? Oh, I was gonna say, do you work out? Yeah. You do. You gotta stretch before that. Okay, so a little you, bit, you gotta you, warm you, up some. You do stretch then. Well, of course. Okay. But you were saying like you never <laughs> You never feel the need to stretch. You're never tight. Usually that, you I stay feel loose, that. Man. I stay loose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I warm up before I'm like going to go exercise. Because that's just foolish. I I think, well, that. a lot of people don't warm up either is what well, I was no about to say. No offense to you who don't, so, but you should. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It makes a difference. Oh, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. You can warm up with like light exercise as opposed to stretching. Mm. Uh, I think there's some debate now, isn't there, about whether you, stretching is that necessary. We're going to get into that a little bit. Today we're talking, if you haven't guessed, we're talking about joint pain and things you can do to mitigate joint pain if you get it often, prevent it, if you haven't had it, but you're heading into those years of your life, like me, where it's all of a sudden piling on. And we're talking to um, two different people today. We're going to start, though, with one of our sports med doctors, um, Dr. Scott Rand. We're here with Dr. Scott Rand sports medicine doctor at Houston Methodist. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I consider myself to be a pretty achy person, I would say. Um, I've dealt with joint pain for a while now. It's kind of one of my chief complaints about my health because I'm a pretty active person. I like to be active. I like to work out most days of the week. I love just going to play basketball on the weekends. When we go on vacation, we're hiking and we're doing things like that. So I have joint pain I would say fairly often enough that it bothers me quite a bit. And so this is a topic today that's near and dear to my heart. I know I'm not the only one dealing with this. Um, it's probably something that spans all ages. We can get into all that. But I would say my personal sort of demon is knee pain. I, I, I have things that I think I know trigger it. it. It's kind of just spanned several years for me. What are some of the other joints that you often see people in the clinic for when it comes to pain? So we see patients with virtually every joint pain. Okay. You, know, you know, back pain is one of the most common things that people come to the doctor for. Uh, in the athletic population that we deal with, often their 
um, joint or muscle or tendon complaint relates to whatever sport they do. Typically, runners will have problems from the waist down. They'll have very predictable injuries or problems that usually, as they start running, start at their ankles and sort of work their way up. Weightlifters, tennis players, overhead athletes like swimmers, basketball players, volleyball players will have fairly predictable shoulder pains. Most of them are related to overuse, and I'm, I tend to think of things in sort of bigger picture things. When I talk to my fellows, when I talk to patients, and I explain how I think about this stuff, I think about, okay, is this pain you earned or pain you didn't earn? Mm. Did you do something to cause this pain? Was there, was there an injury? Uh, or are you doing too much too soon and it's caused you to develop an overuse injury? Or did you just wake up with this pain? And when you just wake up with pain for no good reason, that kind of changes the things I think about uh, and things I worry about for what's causing it. And getting into, you know, you mentioned overuse. And one thing that's been perplexing to me, I would say, is that I do think a lot of my pain is probably overuse at the end of the day. What are the the range of causes that you would say for achy joints? So I wake up in the morning and my knee's pretty stiff. Did I work out too much the day before? Like, what are those reasons that that might be the case? So it's important to define what that means for people. And if you're if you wake up in the morning and your hands are stiff and your wrists are stiff and you have it takes a couple hours to get to where you can make a good grip, then you worry about things like some of the autoimmune arthritis problems. Rheumatoid arthritis classically has morning stiffness as a symptom. Uh, if it's if your knees are stiff, then it's important to kind of define what that stiffness means. Are they stiff because there's fluid in the joint? Is it stiff because the tendons and the, the muscles around the joint have become tight uh, as they sort of repair from the exercise you did the day before? Um, that's how we sort of approach that and look at it. So understanding the why of where that stiffness comes from or what you exactly mean by stiffness is sort of guides what we do for you. To that point, Joint pain, it's not necessarily serious acutely. Is that correct? Like, I don't need to go to the doctor immediately if right. I'm experiencing joint pain. I mean, as someone who has it a lot, I'm assuming I'm, mm -hmm. I'm okay trying to deal with it. Maybe worth saying, when is joint pain something more, just so we can kind of clear the air on that in the sense of if you're feeling pain, um, something not to ignore, what would be those signs? Joint pain that affects function is usually something to pay attention to. If you wake up in the morning and your knee hurts, but 10 steps into your gait, you're walking normally and it doesn't limit your gait, doesn't make you change what you do, you live with that. You know, there, I'm a, I'm a big fan of it'll go away. Uh, and sometimes going to the doctor for things gets you overtreated with medications you don't necessarily need or activity restrictions that aren't really good for you. So my threshold for go to the doctor is, does the pain that you're having limit your function or was there an acute injury that significantly caused you to not be able to do something? Did you fall and break your elbow? Gotcha, Did yeah. you trip and twist your knee? Did you land and feel a pop and then have all of a sudden swelling in your knee? Those pains that are severe or affect your function for more than just a little while are the things I would say, yeah, it needs to go to the doctor. Gotcha. And the other part is if it's if it's just been going on so long and you're just tired of putting up with it um, and what you're, whatever you're having is – going away. I, when I talk to patients with knee arthritis, I tell them, I'm not going to make your arthritis go away, yeah. but we need to make, get to a point where your arthritis doesn't limit what you do. You don't make decisions on what you do during the day based on whether or not your knee will let you. If you're at that point where your knee or your shoulder or your back are keeping you from doing things you want to do, go to the doctor. Yeah. I think that that's an interesting point because it's one of the sort of parts of my, my personal journey with, I mean, I keep bringing this back to myself, sorry, but my personal journey is that I, the movement aspect is what confuses me a lot. Um, because like you've mentioned overuse, you know, I, let's say I work out five days in a row. I'm usually fine. I'll go months without knee pain. Just for some context, I usually do a lot of like body weight circuits and stuff like that. And I let my app kind of just build my body weight circuit for me. Every now and then jumping jacks will pop in there. And I, I have seen that as a trigger in the past. But when I haven't had knee pain for a couple months, I'm like, ah, oh, I'll do them. But then the next day I'm like, here's the knee pain. How do, how do you know when it's like, let me just stop doing jumping jacks forever? Or is this something I can fix so that I can do jumping jacks in the future? Usually that's something that you can fix. Um, okay. Everything kind of depends on where it hurts and when it hurts. So if you do jumping jacks and you notice the next day that the outside part of your knee hurts, um, and that's most likely the place. Yes, it is. <laughs> then, yep, then that, that's usually a problem called iliotibial band syndrome. And it happens because as you land on that leg, the external rotators in your hip have to fire to 
keep your knee from falling in. When those aren't tight enough or aren't strong enough to absorb that, then your IT band or the, what a muscle called the tensor fascia lata that starts at your top of your hip bone and kind of goes down to your knee um, has to be overused. Then it gets tight and then the place where it crosses your knee gets real sore. Okay, so the fix for your knee is actually not in your knee. Okay. The fix for your knee is up in your hip. Mm -hmm. And exercises that strengthen those external rotators keep you from having problems with your knee down the road. Got you. That's always such a weird concept to me that where you're feeling the pain is is not necessarily where the problem is. Um, I'm sure it's true all over the body, but like joint pain for sure seems to be like a classic example of that. Yeah, it's a, the idea is victims and culprits. Okay, the <laughs> like, yeah. you know it very commonly, especially with anterior knee pain, the knee is the victim. Yeah, the culprit is very commonly up in the hip or down in the foot. Okay, gotcha. The other side of movement kind of confuses me too, though, because you know my knee pain seems to be triggered by overuse. But then let's say you know I'm on a flight, we're going on vacation. I'm on a flight for three and a half, four hours. When I get up, like that first couple of steps, I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is so stiff. And like, I haven't really had trouble with my knee lately. So the, the lack of movement, is that also some here in here somewhere with knee pain? I'm thinking, or just sorry, joint pain. Cause I'm thinking of people who I'm really active, but I'm sure people who aren't super active also have joint pain. So is it inactivity just as much? So that holding still for a long time, uh, for any of us, when you're over 30 and sorry, it doesn't get better. I know. Uh, I, it's that immobility, that sitting still for a long time. We call it the theater sign. Okay. Uh, if you have to sit for three hours and watch a movie uh, or be on a flight or sit at your desk and do work, that causes some kind of constant pressure between the underside of your kneecap and where it hits against the, the bottom of your thigh bone. If you do that for 15 minutes, nobody cares. You do it for a longer period of time like that, you get some inflammation it gets really complicated, but it's that function right there at the anterior part of the knee that develops that pain. It's normal. It's you get up and move around. If it bugs you a lot, you take uh, an anti-inflammatory medicine or some Tylenol. It's nothing you should have to take all the time, but it's a common normal pain. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned pain relievers. I want to get to that. But before we do real quick, you did mention knee arthritis at some point. How does someone know if it's joint pain caused by overuse or joint pain caused by arthritis and you do need something like a pain reliever at that point every now and then? There's a big overlap, obviously. Okay. Um, any kind of knee pain can be related to arthritis. And a lot of times I'll have young people come in and say, I have arthritis, and they really don't. Arthritis means there is inflammation inside the joint. Mm. And usually it goes along with joint damage, uh, damage to the cartilage. And it starts – in some people earlier and some people later. It's not caused by activity. Okay, that's an important point. I have a lot of people who come in and say, I had to quit running because I didn't want to get knee arthritis. That's yeah. absolutely false. Okay. okay. We know that people who run have statistically less arthritis than people who don't. The thing that causes knee arthritis is genetics and big injury. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you've torn your ACL, you're going to get knee arthritis. Uh, if you, both, both of your parents had knee arthritis, you're going to get knee arthritis. Gotcha. Picking your parents is important. Okay. So knee arthritis is managed like many overuse things. It's um, consistent activity, sometimes not doing too much too soon. And what we find is that what flares knee arthritis or other things is novel activity. If you walk stairs and you do things and your knees don't bother you, but then all of a sudden you decide to go to the beach and walk four miles on the beach – yeah. And you don't do what you normally did. Your knees don't tolerate that and they'll get inflamed. They'll get sore. They'll get swollen. And it's that swelling inside the joint is usually a sign of cartilage damage or, or arthritis. That explains a lot, to be honest, because sometimes I feel like I am just more prone to this knee pain. Whether I am prone or not staying active, I think I clearly have have decided is helpful. But what you just said, doing something novel or new, for instance, like we hike a lot or well, I say when we go on vacations, we hike. But in Houston, we don't hike a lot. So I'll go from, you know, no real incline miles to, oh, let's do a 12 mile hike. And then surprise, surprise, I am in serious pain the next couple of days for a few weeks. So I think that piece of it maybe is, is a bit I'm missing. I, I, the, I'm so excited to talk to you today because like I just haven't been managing my joint pain very well. I don't think I've come to see sports medicine doctors. I've even dabbled in physical therapy, but I'm now mid thirties at the point where I think about it a lot and I'm ready to just like rein it in and be like everything I can do, I want to do. Um, cause like I said, I want to be active. Um, to that point, you, you kind of mentioned pain relievers. I've read a lot of the different sort of strategies to help relieve joint pain. 
all the way from ice packs after exercising to, you know, maybe wearing a knee sleeve or some other type of brace on and different, depending what your joint pain is in your mind, I know it can vary by joint, but what are some of the key, like best strategies for relieving joint pain once it's started? Some of it is just living with it and realizing sometimes things hurt and okay. you'll get over it. It's sort of the American way to have a pill for everything. And we don't necessarily have to do that. Yeah. You know, sometimes stuff hurts and it's okay. Um, and there's evidence that you know, like ice packs, uh, although they may be nice pain relievers, they decrease blood flow to an area and may limit that healing inflammatory response that we're supposed to have. There's argument about that both ways. In general, I tend to you tell athletes to ice things that hurt after exercise, but there's evidence to say that maybe we shouldn't do that. So right. there's no perfect answer. It's do what works best for you. Uh, from a physical standpoint, it is don't do too much too soon. Okay. Uh, concentrate on your kinetic chain. Uh, make sure that if you if you do get knee pain, if you're doing a bunch of hiking, prepare for that by doing glute strengthening exercises. The stronger you are, typically the less joint pain you have. Okay, specific to the knees, the stronger if you are, stronger you are in your gluteus muscles and in your quads, the less knee problem you'll have. If you're going to do something topically, diclofenac gel uh, is a good choice. Uh, it's recently gone over the counter, very safe and effective for the majority of joint aches. There's a lot of other topical things that are out there that people use for muscle aches and joint pains. Most of them are skin irritants. Mm-hmm icy hot. That's my problem. I have really sensitive skin and I cannot use icy hot. Right. It is the, it's worse than the joint pain. Right. It, what they do is they irritate the skin and increase blood flow and they decrease pain by that, by doing that. You know, they're all the same. They have different names, but they all do about the same thing. Uh, so if you want to use them, they're fine. They, they're a symptom treatment. They don't cure anything. Mm -hmm. There's actually over the last few years, some pretty good evidence that CBD cream helps with muscle aches and joint pains. Um, good level one evidence says that it makes a difference. Doesn't help, doesn't help everybody, but it's worth a try. Gotcha. Um, if you're going to go to medications, American College of Rheumatology first line recommends topical but diclofenic gel, but then after that is Tylenol or acetaminophen. It's very safe to take up to 3,000 milligrams of acetaminophen a day. Uh, so if I have somebody who's having pain, I tell them that taking two extra strength of acetaminophen three times a day is a very safe and very effective thing for a lot of people. The anti-inflammatory medicines, whether they're over-the-counter or by prescription, um, all work about the same way. Okay. Um, they decrease inflammation and decrease pain. They're hard on the stomach and hard on the kidneys. So you shouldn't live with them. You being you know, basically a healthy 30-year-old, you're fine. Yeah. Take some ibuprofen. If you're hurt, you're fine. If you have to live on it, then, or if you have some other chronic medical conditions that make anti-inflammatories not safe for you, then you want to be much more careful about that. But any pill that you're taking, whether it's over the counter or by prescription, if you're having to take it every day to function normally, it's time to go to the doctor. That's kind of the perfect segue into my next question. Okay. Having to rely on pain relievers too long, a reason to come see a sports medicine doctor. Any other ones that you would point out where it's like, hey, it's just time to come in. Let's get to, let's figure out what the problem is and go from there. And, and that's exactly it. When, when you have pain that alters your function, that's, that's my threshold to say, yeah, you need to come to the doctor. You okay. need a diagnosis. And by function, you mean like just my ability to like to do jumping jacks, for instance. Right. Or okay. your ability to walk with a normal gait. Okay. Uh, your ability to flex or extend your knee all the way. So your ability to pick your shoulder up over your head. Those are the things, or a lot of times people with shoulder issues will have a lot of nighttime pain. If your pain keeps you up at night to where you can't sleep, time to come to the doctor. And it's not because there's anything horrible or dangerous going on, but there are a number of things that we can do to help with that that make your life better and make you better able to do the things you want to do. Yeah. And I know we've, I, I've kind of hogged the time talking about knee pain and you mentioned shoulder pain again, you've mentioned back pain. Um, so I don't want people to think that this is all just about knee pain. So any other messages you would kind of send? I know you mentioned not being able to lift your shoulder is a sign. Back pain, when, when is that a sign to come see a sports medicine doctor? So again, back pain is one of the things we see very commonly. On any given day, 30% of the population has back pain that gets their attention, whether, wow. it make, whether it makes them limit what they do yeah. or take something for it or alter their life. It, it's it's there. It's very prevalent. Uh, most back pain problems are related to posture and related to core weakness. So the first thing to do for that is pay attention. Okay. Gotcha. Be mindful of your posture. Be mindful of, and that shoulder pain very commonly also is posture related. Okay. So be mindful of those things. And if you have back pain, that seems to radiate into a leg and it alters your gait. 
if you have any functional deficit, if you, your gait is abnormal, if you feel like you can't pick up a leg or if it feels abnormal, if you have a foot drop, those are things to come to a doctor sooner rather than later. Personal story, two years ago, I ended up having to urgently lift a rather large patient uh, and felt a sudden pain in my back uh, and was bothered by that a little bit. Said, I just strained it. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Press on. Three days later, I'm out for a walk. The day after Christmas, I develop a foot drop. I couldn't pick up my foot anymore. I noticed as I'm walking, it's hitting yeah. every time very hardly. I, I ended up rupturing a disc in my back. That kind of needs to be addressed sort of acutely when you have a neurologic deficit. Okay, so I, I'm fine. Everything all works out okay. But yeah. it's the it's that loss of function more than pain by itself that says this needs to be seen sooner rather than later. Yeah, I think your example paints a perfect picture because as you were saying it, you kind of start to realize what the problem is if you have loss of function, you're not doing something about it because then you're just going to get injured. And that's like definitely what you don't want because sometimes that's something really serious, surgery perhaps even. So um, important message to actually do something about the pain when it starts to affect function, I would say. As far as when someone comes to see you for an appointment, um, what are some of the first things you try to help rectify the pain? What are the kind of like go-to treatments at that point? I guess the, the short answer is it depends. Okay. Uh, the best thing, the most important thing is to get a diagnosis. And to get a diagnosis, what I concentrate on are the and what I teach my fellows is, you know, you think about where does it hurt and when does it hurt? Mm -hmm. So if you know it, the, the anatomy of where things hurt and you know biomechanically what's going on as they have pain, you know, do they have groin pain at foot strike? Do they have pain just going downstairs in the, in the anterior part of the knee? Do they have pain when they land on the inside of their ankle? Those Understanding the anatomy of where, they ha where they're having their problem really drives what we do next. And then the treatments can be physical therapy very commonly – Almost nobody leaves my office without some sort of exercise to do to help alleviate their problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, sometimes that requires physical therapy. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, you know, I'm very aware of the fact that the um, exercises I give people to do often aren't done. <laughs> it, it just yeah. it, it, it's human nature. Yeah. I mean, I I do the same thing. I don't want to have to waste my time worrying about making my body work better. That's right. sort of normal human nature. But at the same time. The exercises do work, okay? But, but sometimes people have enough muscle dysfunction that they really need a professional to help them fire their muscles the right way and get things to work well. And that's where physical therapy comes in, mm -hmm. okay? Gotcha. Uh, sometimes it's medications. Truly really not that often, some, but sometimes medications are useful. Uh, and then the other things we do are a lot of injection kind of therapies, depending on where they hurt and why they hurt. Sometimes decreasing that pain with some sort of an injection allows their muscles to work better and overall makes them better. Yeah. I mean, you, you've talked a lot about when we were talking about kind of my knee pain and how the problems in my hips and how my hips aren't strong enough. I think for me, it took me a long time to realize that it was a strength problem. I guess when it's pain, you're like, no, this means something's not working. Some, and then you don't really ever expect that it's, I'm not strong enough in certain areas also because it's like, hey, I'm active. I'm I'm on the elliptical every other day. I'm, I'm lifting weights. I'm doing body weight exercises. It's kind of hard to believe, but um, I guess what I've learned um, is that there's all these, you know, sort of muscle groups that you don't use commonly or you don't really know. To, you, I know when I'm lifting, you know, through my knees, I can feel my hamstrings, but I don't really feel all the other tiny things. So I've always found that interesting. Runners are probably the worst. <laughs> okay. Runners just want to run. Yeah. They, they, they'll run five it days a week, six I, days a yeah. week. I'm not a big runner, but the, my friends who run, yeah, it's almost all they do sometimes. Yeah. yeah. They, they become remarkably quad dominant and they get very, very tight in the piriformis muscle. I mean, it's runner butt pain. You know, it's classic when they come in and they have this pain on the inside of their knee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can tell where that, where that comes from. But then I turn around and I press on that piriformis muscle and they didn't even realize it hurt, but it hurts like crazy. Yeah. And then you watch them do a single leg squat and they can't keep their knee straight as they do that because it falls in. So successful runners cross train. Mm -hmm. Okay. They have to do core strengthening uh, exercise specific to the glutes and single leg exercises are usually the best. The quote I like is that running six miles is like doing 10,000 single leg squats. Biomechanically, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. So when you go out and run six miles, you've done 10,000 single leg squats. That's crazy. Go you. Yeah. That's crazy to think about because um, I don't think I could do that many. Yeah. But I also don't really run a lot. So maybe that maybe those go in and So hand. the point of that is if all you do is run and you don't specifically train the muscles to do that, they get tight, they get overused, and then you kind of get this cascading pain here that, that is very predictable. 
Yeah. Uh, so the fix for that is sometimes alleviating the pain and then convincing the runners that they have to strengthen these particular muscles in order to be a successful runner. You know, as we close out here, it sounds like a lot of what you've been talking about is prevention related almost. So, I mean, take home message um, that you would give the listeners who are struggling with joint pain like me, how key is prevention and what are kind of like your pillars of prevention and preventing joint pain that you think are important? Well, the first thing is pick your parents better. Okay? Cause <laughs> yeah. if, if, if you've picked your parents, well, I, uh, you're going to do fine. Okay. Perfect. Uh, but separate from that strength helps. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you're training, don't do too much too soon. Pay attention to if you're a lower body exerciser, runner, jumper, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you have bone pain, at foot strike, if that pain is in your foot, in the front of your in the front of your leg, in your groin, and it happens at foot strike, those are stress fractures. That's a big red flag. Go to the doctor for that. Okay. okay? If you have pain after you worked out, stretch. Live with that. Understand delayed onset muscle soreness just happens, and the more you do, the less it will bother you. Uh, don't let your joints run your life. If they're running your life, go to the doctor. If you're just having some soreness that limits you a little bit, but it goes away through the day, good for you. All right. That's just life. You earned it. Yeah. Okay. That's gotcha. Right. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much for coming on today. Uh, this was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. I appreciate being here and having the opportunity. Thank you very much, Katie. So apparently we need to pick our parents better. That's what I learned from that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. I kind of <laughs> laughed at that because it's... You did keep going back to that, but it's a good it's a good joke. Well, and it, it, I mean, it, it kind of like points to the fact that what he said that resonated with me is that some people are just predisposed to this more than others. And then I need to stop. I think I need to stop thinking of joint pain as like this thing I'm going to just like crush and it's my fault and I'm never going to have it again. I think I'm always going to kind of come in and out of it, but there's certainly a lot of stuff I can do to keep me out of the joint pain more than in it is kind of what I took away. I think uh, Zach and I both picked our parents. Well, nice job guys. Ah, good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, in that, to that point, you know, I thought about my own family history and there are folks that have knee pain and at some point it did, uh, lead them to have mobility issues. So it's something to keep in mind and a reason to really get strong and, uh, focus on my, my mobility like that. Because I think as, uh, we age, you know, I think working out and stretching and all of the good things that we can do. Um, it becomes less and less about aesthetics and more about just, hey, I want to live my life well. Yeah, I could not agree with that more. I think when I was in my 20s, I was working out solely just to be like, oh, keep myself like, you know, fit and slim. And now I'm like, I just want to be able to, you know, go on these hikes that we're about to do in a couple mm -hmm. of weeks. And like, I want to be ready for them. I want to be able to do those hikes and not feel sore after and not feel... Like I'm in pain for months after. So it truly is exactly what it is. And, you know, Kim, you mentioned it, um, strength. I think that was like the, the theme of, of what Dr. Rand was mentioning. The stronger you are, the less joint pain you have. Just another reason that everybody should do some strength training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the official recommendations twice a week, mm -hmm. you know, he mentioned physical therapy as, as a part of, of dealing with joint pain. I myself have done physical therapy a few times. And so, um, next we're going to talk to a physical therapist. Um, we're going to talk to Corbin Hett. He's a physical therapist here at Houston Methodist, and he's going to walk us through that part of the journey when you have joint pain and you're going to a physical therapist, what to expect an appointment, you know, what, what things does he sort of recommend for dealing with joint pain? So that's up next. All right. Well, I'm here with Corbin Hett. Corbin, thanks so much for being with us today. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, it's interesting because I know some of what you do is probably uh, rehabbing people after an injury. So let's say they tear an ACL or let's say it's a torn Achilles. I, I picked two of like the worst ones. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are very common. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you know, you're, you're taking someone, but you're like bringing someone back after that, like getting them, yeah. you know, fit and physical again. How much, I'm curious, so how much of what you do on your day to day is, is it like people like me who just have these aches that won't go away? Like, let's say I've got shoulder pain that's just not going away mm -hmm. or, you know, my lower back is just hurting so much. I can't get it to go away. How much of your day to day is like helping those people? Yeah. So I guess what you're describing is like the dichotomy between the surgical cases and like the non-surgical cases. Yeah. 
for me at least, it, it probably averages out about 50-50, okay. where half of my caseload is post-op, half the caseload is people trying to prevent surgery or um, who are kind of just dealing with those nagging things that limit them in life and they're not happy with it, so they want to just get that better. Um, so yeah, it, it's kind of a good split between the two. Yeah. I mean, so I guess maybe more common than I was thinking, actually. Mm-hmm. I My personal demon, you know, we've talked about this. My personal demon is knee pain. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly have been dealing with it since like my mid-20s. And when it started, I was very like hesitant to like accept that it could be anything other than like an injury. So mm-hmm. I was like, I, you know, I grew up playing sports and when things hurt, it was because like, oh, I rolled my ankle right, in a basketball right. game. Like there was a very like tangible reason why like, oh, this hurts. In my 20s, I got to a point where, like, I just had a nagging knee pain that I could not get to Cause, go away. Just because you woke up one day. Exactly. Right, yeah. Right. Every day it would be, like, clicking while going upstairs and, like, would hurt when I'd bend. And so it took me a while, I think, to – I would go see a sports medicine doctor. They would say, like, look, it's probably time for physical therapy. And mm-hmm. I'd be like, what's that? You know, yeah. I, don't, I don't know anything about this. And, like, I don't think I need that. Um, typical, you know, 20-year-old 20, 20 uh, type stuff. When I did finally go see a physical therapist – had my mind blown by the fact that um, at the time, like kind of one of the things that was said to me, and again, we don't need to take this as medical fact because it's been 10 years, but so the, the gist of it was like, well, your hip, your hip muscles are kind of weak. Mm-hmm. Like we actually just need to work on your hip muscles. Right. And you're like, I came to you for my knee. Why are you looking at my head? Yes, exactly. And that's <laughs> yeah. what I want to ask you about. I mean, this is, there's this thing of where I'm feeling the pain in my knee, mm-hmm. but that's not the source of the problem. So mm-hmm. like, talk to us about like, as far as the anatomy of some of this joint pain goes, yeah. like, what is this mystery of like pains in the knee, but problem is somewhere completely else right. probably. Yeah. The, the phenomenon that you're talking about, there's like regional interdependence or the like kinetic chain where everything even though it's it's independent of like the knees, obviously separate from the hip, they're very much connected pretty directly. Yeah. Um, but even like further distal things, so like the back and the ankle can have a good play on each other, or like your shoulder and your elbow, and you know there's various things and and patterns that we kind of see that interact with each other pretty dominantly. And so the knee, for instance, is so um, predominant on what the hip and the the trunk or the core are doing. Um, and if you have any any big deficits, either in like your your glute muscles or, or anything like that, um, that that aren't allowing your knee to kind of work in that proper functional position or plane, you end up with these kind of wear and tear type situations where you know there there's some natural wear and tear throughout life, but when you have structures that are they're you know adversely stressed for a given amount of time, they're eventually going to hurt. Mm-hmm. And that's a, a very common thing that we see. And and a lot of times the the art of our like evaluation process is is not just looking at the joint that you're coming in with with the pain for, but what's also happening above and below that to make sure that we don't miss anything. Um, because if I were to just like directly only kind of, uh, you know, horse blinders look at your knee, I might miss some things that are, are leading into it. And that part is what's so interesting to me because I think when I was younger, a lot of the like my knee pain was like, okay, maybe it's your IT band is tight and your hips are tight and yeah. stuff like that. And and that's when, you know, before we move into like what a physical therapy appointment looks like and things like that, I wanted to ask you on the prevention side of joint pain. So I guess in my mind, once I realized, oh, it's my muscles around my knee yeah. that might be kind of some of the problem and maybe they're tight and sometimes – you know, there's a lot of like things you can use to relieve tightness. And so to take a segue into the prevention here real quick, because I think a lot of people listening to this are probably like me. They're dealing with joint pain and they kind of like maybe don't want to have to go see someone right, quite right. yet. And I don't blame them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The first one I think about is is stretching. And that comes from a place of I keep getting ads for these like stretch labs. Yeah. Where the concept is like once a week you come in and someone like literally stretches you for 60 minutes. Mm-hmm. My first part of this question as far as preventing joint pain is like, is how important is stretching? First of all, not as important as some people make it seem. Um, there, there are instances where there, there are certain groups of people that absolutely need more flexibility, um, in certain occupations where you're sitting for eight, 10, 12 plus hours a day. Um, there's a good chance there's certain muscles that are very tight and that need to be stretched out. But I think what we're starting to see a lot more in the clinic is that um, there are folks out there who are doing all these stretching activities and and like your your yoga purists and your Pilates folks, like all those are really cool, really great things. But um, 
we we have this subgroup of people who are what we call hypermobile, meaning their joints are already really really flexible. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, their muscles will be tight. Um, but a lot of times that sensation of tightness comes from a lack of motor input into the muscle. So it gives you that perception of tightness rather than actually being hmm. tight. I can't tell you how many times I'll get somebody who comes in and they're like, yeah, my hamstrings are just always so tight. So I'm constantly stretching them, this and that. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, if you're constantly stretching, why are you tight? And so naturally I'll yeah. put them on the table and I'll look at their hamstring and they're going miles beyond where I could ever dream to go. Um, and I'm like, yeah, you're not tight, but what you are is weak. And so we, we see a lot of these folks who just focus, hyper-focus on stretching, 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 but they don't get the back balance of the strengthening aspect of mm. it. Um, and so very often we, we see more of a, a weakness component feeding into that. And generally that should be kind of more of the focus and the prevention side. Because if you're strong, that's going to outweigh any like flexibility deficits that you may have. And that'll help with keeping the joints happy, keeping the bones and, and muscles happy overall. The next two kind of things I wanted to ask you about might follow down this train, but we can kind of like nix them or not. A tool that I've used forever, a uh, foam roller, mm -hmm. um, excruciatingly painful yes. at times. Like when I roll on my IT band, like it's, I mean, it's better now, I would say, because I've been doing it so long. But when I first started, I was like, this cannot be good for me. I feel like I'm really <laughs> it's hurting. It's demonic This almost. is worse than yeah. knee pain. What is a foam roller doing? Should we be using them? Like what role can they play in joint pain prevention when it's tight muscles, things yeah. like that? It's, it's kind of one of those things. It's an enigma. We, we aren't exactly sure like the, the underlying principle of what's happening. Oh, wow. Um, you're, you're basically, you're creating this like physical, um, you're, you're mushing your muscles up, right? Um, your IT band itself, like that's the number one thing that people will, will foam roll. Mm -hmm. Your IT band itself doesn't actually stretch. It's, okay. it's a very firm, um, taut structure and it's meant to be that way. It just kind of encapsulates the side of your leg. Um, but when you're actually foam rolling the side of your leg, you're actually more so for lack of a better term, massaging out your lateral quad or your hamstring. And, um, what, what'll happen is if you do have any little trigger points in there or bands of like top muscle, you'll physically force those to elongate. And that's kind of okay. part, partially the theory of why you gain uh, range of motion quickly thereafter, um, while you feel a little bit better after my thought is you're no longer putting yourself through torture. So naturally you're going to feel better. It's a good point. I do feel better after. I feel exactly. Well. Um, and so there's something also to be said about that noxious input that yeah. you're giving your body to where you're kind of giving your nervous system a little reset. And so it takes a little bit of the focus off of the knee pain that mm. you have. And there, there's certain situations where, yeah, it's absolutely appropriate to do it. In my case, I had an ACL reconstruction six years ago, um, and I got to just this this point where I was stuck and not being able to be productive with a few different exercises. Um, and my therapist, I was a PT, but I had somebody guiding me through it at the time. He suggested me to foam roll, and I was like, "Oh, that doesn't do anything. That's that's hocus pocus." So, but I actually did it, and it was remarkable how much better it made me feel, even if in the short term, it allowed me to be more productive with certain things. And so for folks who like to do it, I'm, I'm all for it. I say, go for it. You're probably not going to hurt yourself as long as you're doing it right. But in, in terms of like directly suggesting it, there's, there's certain like times and places where, where I'd say that's probably beneficial and like massage guns too along the same principle. Yeah. Yeah. Massage guns are what I was going to ask you about next. They're tricky because, you know, like I bought a quote unquote cheap one and I mean cheap because it was $70. Like these things can go up to like 300. So I'm oh, calling yeah. a $70 Plus. cheap one and the battery died in like a year and a half. Yeah. So it's like, are they worth the cost in the sense of like, am I getting enough bang for my buck there knowing that I, I might need to spend like quite, quite a bit of money? Can I do something else like foam roll or yeah. is all of it just, that would be you know, a, no. a a cheaper okay. um, kind of version of it. The massage gun, folks have studied it and they, they'll they say that it's analogous to doing 15 minutes of foam rolling, but only like two minutes with the gun. Okay. So it's, it's time a time saver, saver okay. I guess, if anything. You're able to adjust the intensity of it. So while the foam roller is just a 10 out of 10. Say, it seems to hurt less, <laughs> I will say. It definitely hurts less. Um, there's something to like the vibration stimulus of it that that can tone down some some painful effects. But Again, it's one of those things where I'm like, you know what? If you like it, if you can afford it, go for it. Um, but at the end of the day, we should probably be correcting the issue of like, 
what's causing this perceived tightness in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even as you've been talking about these three things, it, you've, you've mentioned the art of physical therapy and stuff. And it does like, as you're talking about it, it's like, yeah, it does sound like an art and kind of like maybe why physical therapy becomes the treatment for some of these issues. And you mentioned strengthening and it's like, I would have never known what to strengthen when my knee was hurting. Like, absolutely. There's no way I could know that. So along that line, you know, moving into physical therapy, let's say, you know, your doctor's like, Hey, I think you need to go see a physical therapist about this, like whether it's lower back pain, shoulder pain for me, knee pain. Um, talk us through like the basic principles of physical therapy, what it's trying to achieve, what you're doing when you're working with someone. So basic concept is anytime we get somebody for the first time that that first visit's always a one-on-one -on -one evaluation. So I'm face to face with, to, with you for at least 60 minutes and, um, I'm trying to get to the root of the problem that you're coming in for. Um, and a good portion of that is talking and getting an understanding of what you're dealing with, kind of why you're dealing with it, when you're dealing with it, what's the frequency of your symptoms, what's the intensity like, the duration, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Were there any specific mechanisms involved? And you're really just painting the picture of the history leading up to that point because that's going to give me um, a better idea at trying to diagnose the situation more than anything um, is what does the history look like? And then, you know, once once we've talked through some things and for a lot of folks, just that that therapeutic, like yeah. venting, talking it out is is more beneficial than anything, honestly. But yeah. um, I try to just put on my listening ears and sit there and and be a sponge for everything that, that they can give me. And then from that, I'm building in my head throughout the course of them them talking to me the, the foundation of what I want to look at from a physical standpoint. So we, we take our subjective information and then we look at them from a physical capacity, be it functional testing. How do you walk? How do you climb stairs? How do you reach overhead? Things like that. Um, how do you squat down and, you know, get to the floor, that type of thing. And maybe more specifically at strength of individual muscles, you know, what's, what's potentially weak here? What's causing these weird functional things? Cause somebody could do something in a weird way, but that's just because that's how they've done it all their lives. Yeah. And they didn't know that was maybe not a benefit. I, I don't like to say you're doing something wrong. Right. It's just inefficient or not beneficial for yeah. you. And maybe it's due to weakness or maybe it's just due to the fact that they haven't been exposed to the right way or the best way to do that. Um, or range of motion, you know, uh, are certain joints limited or muscles tight mm -hmm. or, you know, different structures limiting you from moving the way that you should. And things like that. What's the tissue quality feel like? I'm getting usually 99% of the people that I get in and evaluate, I'm getting hands on and getting a feel for the area that they're talking about so that, that I can better just grasp what's happening from a regional standpoint. And then from that, we, we gain our information, what's weak, what's tight, what's whatever. Um, and then we develop our plan together. And cause we'll have folks that come in they're like, Hey, I knew I needed to come to you. I don't want this to be a recurrent thing. I have a very busy life, but if you could show me like the most bang for my buck type things that I can keep up with, that'd be great. Um, or we have folks that are, that are set and they're like, I want to come in and see you for three days a week. Um, you know, doctor wrote the script for it and I'm here for it. Let's do it. So from all that information, we develop our plan on, on what we want to do from um, like a, a therapeutic standpoint in the clinic and what you need to be doing at home. Hmm, the homework. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause so much of, what happens from that standpoint on is is dependent on what we teach you. So it's very much an educational mm -hmm. thing yeah. um, in addition to a physical thing. Because if you're seeing me once or twice a week for six, eight weeks or whatever, in totality of it all, that's a very short amount of time. But if we can teach you how to keep up with things and how to be very consistent and diligent at home, that's going to make a world of difference because you're going to get way more time and, and just exposure to the things that you need to get. I know that's a long convoluted answer to it, but all in all, the, the biggest thing that we're trying to do is educate people and, and teach them. And then when they're in the clinic, we, we adjust and basically modify and progress as, as much as we can. Yeah. As you talk about education, I think I've, I've done physical therapy a few times and it always amazes me when, like when I, when I'm starting, it's very basic fundamental things that they've had me do. And it, it's kind of like made me realize that like, I think sometimes when I'm working out and exercising, I'm way focused on the end product and oh, not yeah. like the process mm -hmm. and physical therapy has helped me kind of realize like, no, there's a lot of process here. 
Very much so. Yeah. And it's it's a humbling experience for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, we'll get them in and we're doing little one pound weight exercises. Yes. Yeah. And they look at us like we're crazy when we're handing them these little pink dumbbells. Yeah. And it's like, well, yes, it's it seems rudimentary. It seems very like benign and, and fundamental, but there's there's a reason behind it, mm -hmm. right? generally like it's those little small muscle groups that you don't work in the gym that end up weak that end up over elongated and and things like that and those are the ones that are kind of the the trouble factor the the root cause of the issue and so yeah whenever i get a a 18 year old in here and i'm giving them little pink dumbbells i have to very very carefully approach that yeah to to gain their buy-in so that they're not saying all right this guy doesn't know what he's doing i'm going to just go back to the gym and hopefully it gets better on its own um we're having to very very carefully educate them on like so the muscles that we're working are very small they're mm -hmm. like less than an inch in diameter these light weights are going to help you target that area that we want specifically which will ultimately eventually get us to the point that we want but that way we're not missing the boat. And if we lift too heavy, you end up working the wrong muscles, so on and so forth. So Yeah, it's exactly that, I think, in my mind. Because, I mean, and, and it's it's these large muscle groups. Like, when I'm doing, like, when I'm working out, I'm going, like, full speed. And, like, the goal is to, like, lift as hard as I can or something mm -hmm. like that. I often don't take a step back. And I'm like, what about just, you know, like you said, these fine the motor basics. skills. The yeah. basics. The fundamentals. Yeah, and exactly. We I, I try to preach like we we never want to forget the basics. And I teach this to all of our students and residents. Um, if you neglect the basics, that's when the bigger, sexier stuff will will not happen the way that you want it to. And if you want to be successful at that stuff, I'm all for it. That's what I'm pushing for. Um, but we always have to bring it back down to like those foundational elements. Um, because if if there is weakness in any little group or if there's a range of motion issue that we're just – glossing over and neglecting, that's where those problems kind of compound down the road. Yeah. So when it comes to, to achy, achy knees in my case, or achy shoulder, is it often, it sounds like to me, what you're saying is, you know, yeah, maybe there's some tightness here and there, but more often than not, it's just weak, these weak weakness and these small muscles that just don't get worked at when you're doing your workouts. And that's what, that's what we're trying to correct here. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times it's, it's very much a, a strength issue, a weakness issue, um, or just a motor control issue. You may have the strength, but you don't know how to engage those muscles kind of in, in an efficient pattern to, to help your, yourself out more. I want to circle back to uh, sort of like a prevention topic again, or, but in my mind, maybe not necessarily prevention, but if someone does tend to have achiness here and there, would you say, cause I would say like, I just feel like everything hurts sometimes. Like I'm focusing, <laughs> I'm focusing on my knees right now. Cause like right now I've, I have some knee pain actually, mm. but I mean, like, I don't know. I just feel like I'm achy. Would you say there's benefit in someone seeing a physical therapist just to say like, Hey, head to toe, like, what are you using wrong? Where are you imbalanced? Like, I don't want, I like to, I love being active. I'm an active person. We go hiking several times a year. I hate this thing of where like, I feel like my body is failing me. And right. so like, is just trying to kind of come in once a year and being like, look at me, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Like I've been trying to do all the right things. You guys are teaching me, but I'm still just like yeah. messing up somewhere. Obviously I'm biased a little bit. Yes. I, I would love if everybody could go to PT like once a year um, to get a, a checkup or a um, kind of refresher on things. Yeah. Inevitably, like we, we look very closely at things and oftentimes if you look hard enough, you're usually going to find something. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, um, I try to toe that line and, and just be very careful with my language with folks. Like, even though I'm finding things in here, it's, it's all in all not to say that anything's wrong or, or to be too scary. Like it, something's going to break or anything like that. Cause oftentimes that can be more damaging than whatever they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Um, my usual like spiel is like, we're trying to make you as efficient as possible. So you yeah. don't have to deal with things down the road so that whenever you do encounter things like this, you're, you're empowered with the tools to, to kind of manage it on your own. And so that's again, where the, the educational piece comes in. Yeah. It's funny. We're in a profession where we are trying to get people better so that they never have to come back and see us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but inevitably maybe probably do. I would right, say. right, yeah. right, right, right. I think just with everybody living longer and stuff, yeah. we're naturally going to be in demand for a long time. But um, yeah, I don't want you to have to feel like you need to come see me too often, too long, et cetera. Um, so I want to, to, yeah, have that 
that opportunity to intervene with, even if it's a simple thing, like just, this is what you should work on from like a once or twice a week basis to, to keep those knees healthy and happy. And these are some of the mechanical things that you can think of going forward so that when that new habit is ingrained, well, now you won't you probably won't have to deal with some of the things that you've that have kind of boiled up until this point. Yeah, I think one question I have coming out of that is I I hate to say this is how I think about exercise, but it is. And mm -hmm. I don't think I'm alone. I think of like you hear you're supposed to exercise some certain amount of week. Like I've said, I'm trying to like my end goal is like to stay fit and healthy. Right, right. Like you just mentioned, well, maybe work on these things twice a week. Like, what can I trade those for? <laughs> so I guess my question, exactly. like, does yeah. it count as my, my strength training? Like, or is this really like an add on that I need to be doing for the long term investment? Like, how would you talk about that? And that's a good question. And that's really where the like getting to know the patient in front of us kind of falls in. Okay. Like, what are your goals? What What do you like to do? What do you ultimately like? What's feasible in your week? Like. Mm -hmm. Are you a a mom of five and, you know, you literally don't have time for exercise? Right. Um, how am I going to, like, maximize your productivity in that time? Or are you a marathon runner where that's your job and, you know, you've already got your training schedule and there's certain things that, you know, they can only afford to give up and, and trade or whatever? So that that's where it, the, the art of that comes in and just in getting to know the goals and stuff. Okay. More often than not, it's just about educating on how to be active and how to remain active as much as possible. Um, it's the sedentary ones that we get that are kind of the the tough eggs to crack where, yeah. where we have to, you know, get them, get them moving again, get them working again, but also find ways that they're comfortable with doing that and that we know that they're going to actually keep up with and not just be like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll do that. And then, yeah. As soon as they leave you, they never even look at it again. Right. right? So, yeah. Well, it's that homework, you know. Exactly. <laughs> it yeah. Seems yeah. You, you're just like, oh man, I got to do more. <laughs> right, right, right. And and that's part of our job too is is recognizing, you know, when that can become a hindrance. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to give somebody 20 different things. Well, if they were actually going to do all that, that'd be fantastic. But I know the odds of somebody, me giving somebody a packet of 20 exercises and going home and actually doing that are relatively low. So uh, that's that's where I get a feel for the person and, and what they're actually going to do and what's feasible and, you know, what they're going to keep up with. Yeah. You know, you mentioned being sedentary and it's it's interesting because I think I have noticed even with my own sort of like achy joints is it gets worse when I'm not active. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fairly active, to be honest. But even Good. just that one or two days that I'm not working out in a row, yeah. I'll notice is like when I'm the achiest. So. I mean, how much of preventing joint pain, too, is like you just said, like staying moving, even if it's, you know, some of the basic stuff? So much. Yeah. Honestly, like if if we could just keep people moving, you could do away with so many surgeries and PT appointments wow. and medications, all the opioids and stuff like that. I pulled up a couple of studies that I have in my notes that found that people who exercised for at least 30 minutes most days of the week were 40 percent less likely to develop osteoarthritis mm. than those who did not exercise. And that's just, you know, they talk 30 minutes most days. That could be something as simple as taking a walk around the block. Yeah. Um, you know, walking up and down the stairs a few times, doing some squats in front of the TV. It doesn't have to be anything like overbearing or overtaxing or anything like that. But the fact that you're moving and you're giving that input to the, the muscles and the joints and the bones, that'll keep things from becoming fragile because our body has these mechanisms of, of maintaining or degrading. And if you're not using something naturally, you lose it that old adage. Yeah. Um, and so if you can stay moving, you can prevent a lot of this stuff that, I mean, back in 2020, there is 790,000 total knee replacements and 450,000 hip replacements in just that year alone. So that's well over a million in just one year. And that continues to go up every year. And so, yeah. um, for a lot of those folks, if they could just develop those good habits early on, Ideally, we could prevent a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, moving sounds like a take-home message. Making sure even small muscles are strengthened and able to support, you know, the bigger muscles sounds like a take-home message. Anything else you would say to people, you know, as a physical therapist and you're you're saying like, hey, here's what to do if you're getting achy. And even before you're getting achy, like yeah. what, what, what do you say to people? Seek professional help whenever you have pain. Pain is not a, a natural thing. Um, it's not something necessarily to be scared of, but... At the same time, you want to understand like why that's happening, mm -hmm. um, especially if it's a consistent thing, if it's a chronic thing. 
seek help, see see what's going on, advocate to see a PT. Obviously, I'm biased, but um, <laughs> I will say I I wish I could see one like I wish I could see a PT like once a month. I feel like maybe again it's because I'm achy, but like mm-hmm. I just love like you said, you mentioned education. And I never thought of it like that, but I always do feel like I leave those appointments where I'm just like wow, I just learned so much that I move all the time, but I do not know what I'm doing. It turns right, out right, <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, and understanding like you may be an active person, but at the end of the day, there's, there's always little nuanced things Mm -hmm. that, that can be worked on and that can be improved. Um, and it's, it's a investment obviously, um, in time and effort and all that, but worthwhile when you talk about the longevity of, of things and, and wanting to stay active and remain active to, to prevent a lot of these things that happen later on down the road. Yeah, I know. I think that's me. Like I want to stay active and, well, thank you for thank you for coming on today. This was this was super awesome. Um, very helpful. Um, and we're so glad you joined us. Thank you so much for having me. You're not tight, you're weak. <laughs> I want to put that on a poster, like look it up for it for motivation or that last set, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like that that's very like that's hardcore. I like it. No, I loved it too. Um, and it makes the point perfectly of you know, I, I think my stretching helps, <laughs> but I think, you know, I could agree. I could say, you know, we said this off from in the beginning, like, I don't actually know what it is that I do that helps me keep the joint pain away. One of the many things I do is stretch, but I certainly also do way more strength training, um, now. So I am much stronger than I was 10 years ago when I started dealing with joint pain. Well, continuing on talking about stretching, I, I think it was interesting that you guys talked about some people overstretch. Mm-hmm. I, I might, who knows? <laughs> but yeah, I think. Because you just think like, oh, that's what you're supposed to do. Well, and it, it does. I agree. He said it. There is a temporary relief that comes after stretching. If my knee's hurting and I stretch the muscles around my knee, I do feel better for the next 30 minutes. Now, whether, you know, like I said, maybe it's temporary. Um, the long-term solution is obviously strength training and figuring out what muscles are weak, where is their imbalance. Going to physical therapist has been really helpful for me in that regard because I mean, I can't tell what muscles aren't strong enough. They're tiny and they're inside of there and it's not like they're what's hurting. So, um, yeah, it's, it's always fun for me to talk to Corbin. Yeah. I appreciated what he said about, you know, using smaller weights and really focused movements for certain muscles, because, you know, I think when you hear the phrase strength training, you think, you know, you need to be doing it for the gains. You need to be, you need to be like really lifting. And that's not me. I I like, I like my little small threes and fives. Like, and you know what that reminds me of? Is what? that episode of The Office where they they open up Michael Scott's <laughs> yes. trunk? Yes. And he uses yes. those two pound weights. He's like going for toe, not bulk. Yep. But <laughs> it's a joke. Yeah. But it, there's some logic to oh, it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, Kim. I think, and even in physical therapy, sometimes they like give you this tiny little thin band and they're like, mm-hmm. put it around your ankles. Oh, the and, bands. And, oh, do, yeah. and you're like, please. And they're like, do two sets of 10. You're like, I could do this in my sleep. And then halfway into the first set, you're like, wow, I didn't know there were muscles right. It, where yeah. like, I'm feeling the burn right now. Band training is like the worst. It's mm-hmm. so deceptive because you're right. It's like, a, it's like a rubber band. Like how hard could it be? Yeah. And that's the, one of the most exhausting things I've done. Yeah. I think they, it's the targeting of these little muscles that kind of get overlooked when you're just sprinting down a basketball court <laughs> in a pickup game or, or something like that. Uh, you do have to, to Kim's point, like you do have to take time to actually work on those, those fine tune, those small muscles. It's, it's definitely helped me a lot. Maybe I was late to the game. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never been the type that's like, you know, I've got to lift X amount of weights to feel like I'm meeting some goal. I, and I think valuing that it is a journey and that when you're dealing with something like pain or you're just trying to get stronger in general, you know, the the little things can help you build up to those bigger goals. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just say when I talk about strength training for myself, I do body weight exercises. So I do not pick up a single weight, mm. but I have I have I can tell how much stronger I am. And like I've been doing this for two or three years and yeah, it was slow and it took time, but I can tell I'm stronger and I'm just doing push ups or just squats with my own body weight. So, I mean, I st- Kim, you mentioned strength training can come with this very like scary picture of like this big dude in a gym, like <laughs> tossing some like bags around mm-hmm. or has got the like cords doing this. You need protein powder. Yeah. Protein yeah. powder. Yeah. And I got to start thinking how much protein I'm taking in every day. And I got to like wake up at four 30 in the morning or I have to stay up till 12. Like, no, I just literally do 20 minutes of body weight training twice a week. But that's my natural inclination is, is to always push at some period of time. I want to keep adding on the weight mm-hmm. until finally I injure myself, um, strain a muscle. And then I lay off 
and then I stretch. That's when I really do stretch, and I start the, the weight very low to build up again. So I think I've, I haven't been incorporating those things. I think that's a good point. That's a whole other probably topic we need to address because I think that's very common. People kind of ramping up either too much or too fast, or even if it's not too fast, just your body can really only do so much and knowing what your own limits are. Um, because yeah, that's another thing too. The whole point of all this is to be mobile and stay active. So if you're, if your workout regimens injuring yourself with these overuse injuries, that's, that's no fun either. Well, as someone with the most joint pain of all of us, Katie, did, did you find this a productive conversation and can you walk away with it with some good tips? I really did. So I think, I think, um, I have always had a bit of a pessimistic attitude towards my joint pain. Um, but I actually left both of these kind of chats feeling like, okay, this is actually just part of my life. I need to stop like running away from it and run like towards it with all this like new, like these pieces of advice of like, okay, I'm doing the right thing with my body weight training. Like that's helping the stretching. I could be overstretching. Maybe I need to rethink that. You know, I think really just dedicating my mind towards the things that like I know are working. Um, yeah, I took a lot, a lot out of this. And, you know, I chatted with these guys a few months ago now and I have, I have not had, um, not in joint pain right now. So there you that's go. a, that gets an upvote. Check. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of On Health with Houston Methodist. Share, like, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We drop new episodes every Tuesday morning, but until then stay tuned, stay healthy.